Dear colleagues, can I ask you to take your places because we will start in some minutes. Chers collègues, je vous invite à prendre place puisque nous commençons maintenant notre réunion plénière qui est la première de l'année 2018. Est-ce que quelqu'un a une objection sur l'ordre du jour Non, c'est très bien, il est adopté. Le procès verbal de notre dernière réunion des 30 novembre et 1er décembre vous a été soumis. Pas d'objection, alors l'ordre du jour est adopté. Il est plus agréable de travailler s'il y a un minimum de calme dans la salle parce que ce n'est pas une foire généralisée, mais une assemblée Délu. Merci beaucoup. Sehr geehrter Herr Erster Vizepräsident, lieber Franz Timmermans, zunächst möchte ich Ihnen im Namen aller Kolleginnen und Kollegen recht herzlich dafür danken, dass Sie heute unser Gast sind und vor unserem Plenum das Wort ergreifen. Wir werden heute mit Ihnen das Arbeitsprogramm 2018 der Kommission diskutieren zu dem unser Ausschuss ja bereits im Dezember eine Entschließung verabschiedet hat. Aber ich bin davon überzeugt, unsere Diskussionen werden sich, nur, werden sich sicherlich nicht nur auf dieses Arbeitsprogramm beschränken. Ich denke, es geht uns allen auch nicht zuletzt darum, einen Gedankenaustausch darüber zu führen, wie die regionale und lokale Dimension in allen Politikbereichen der Europäischen Union aufgewertet und gestärkt werden kann. Dass die Städte und Regionen, 
dass die Bürgerinnen und Bürger, die dort leben, der eigentliche Schwerpunkt der Europäischen Union ausmachen, das wissen wir, das müssten eigentlich alle auch verstehen. Aber manchmal hat man den Eindruck, es ist schon mal hin und wieder nötig, es zu wiederholen. Wenn wir Innovation und Wachstum vorantreiben wollen, wenn wir mehr sozialen Zusammenhalt erreichen möchten, dann müssen wir Ergebnisse bei der Politikgestaltung von der europäischen Ebene bis zu der lokalen hinkriegen und am besten muss das alles kohärent zusammenpassen. So wie das ja übrigens auch als Zielvorgabe nochmals in der Erklärung von Rom anlässlich der 60 Jahre Europäische Union verdeutlicht worden ist. Aber heute vielleicht noch mehr als in der Vergangenheit ist auch wichtig darauf hinzuweisen, dass diese Europäische Union nicht nur ein Wirtschaftsprojekt, ein politisches Projekt ist. Es ist vor allem und nicht zuletzt auch ein Projekt, das auf fundamentalen Grundwerten aufbaut. Und das ist, gerade wenn wir langfristig zusammen uns entwickeln wollen, von allergrößter Bedeutung. 2016 hat der Präsident der Kommission die Zukunft der Europäischen Union in der Form von fünf Szenarien andiskutiert. Im letzten Jahr hat er seine eigene Synthese dazu in der Form eines sechsten Szenarios vorgetragen. Und wir sollten alle der Kommission dafür dankbar sein, dass sie diesen Denkprozess über die Zukunft der Europäischen Union so systematisch, ich würde schon fast sagen pädagogisch, angepackt hat. Denn man sieht allerortens in Europa, dass diese Diskussion geführt wird. Aber man sieht auch überall in Europa, dass wir noch ein großes Problem haben. Und das ist nicht unbedingt die Frage, ob wir jetzt alle gemeinsam im selben Tempo vorankommen. Das wäre natürlich besonders gut. Aber die wichtigste Frage und die vielleicht schwierigste Frage ist die, ob es uns gelingt, gemeinsam eine Richtung für diese Bewegung in die Zukunft zu definieren. Denn ohne diese Richtung kann das europäische Projekt nicht vorankommen. Bei all dem spielt die Ebene der lokalen und regionalen Gebietskörperschaften eine wichtige Rolle. Das wird jetzt auch noch unter anderem im Rahmen der Debatten der Taskforce Subsidiarität deutlich werden, die ja unter dem kompetenten und zielorientierten Vorsitz von Ihnen, Herr Erster Vizepräsident, arbeitet. Und wir werden sicherlich heute die Gelegenheit haben, zu all diesen Fragen einen interessanten Gedankenaustausch hier zu erleben. Deshalb erteile ich Ihnen mit sehr großer Freude unmittelbar das Wort. Herzlichen Dank, Herr Präsident. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to um, have a debate with you today about the Commission Work Programme, which of course um, is placed in a much wider framework of a discussion we need to have because this is the last Commission Work Programme with concrete plans for legislation uh, why? Uh, because we only have a year and a half left in the mandate of this Commission of this European Parliament. If we want legislation to be adopted still in this mandate, we will have to submit uh, that legislation, the draft legislation, to the European Parliament, the Council, by, let's say, May this year at the latest, if we really want things still to lead to concrete conclusions. And it is my firm belief that in 2019, when there are European elections, we will only get people interested in those elections and people take the trouble to go and vote in these elections if they see concrete results. The quality of our proposals will not convince. Only the quality of the results we deliver working for the European citizens. And we do this in or arguably one of the most complicated uh, times. Uh, we've just come out of what was the worst crisis, this continent, economic crisis, this continent has faced since uh, the 1930s. It is also a time of great turmoil, both in terms of security, but also in terms of uh, the organization of our society. We are at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution, and there is not a single citizen in Europe 
there's not a single citizen in the whole world that will not be affected by these paradigm changes in the way we live, in the way we work, in the way we relate to others. So if we want to be effective with policies we need to ward off the risks of this development and to grasp the opportunities of this development, we need to be in touch with the dreams, anxieties, wishes, hopes of our citizens. And we cannot do this if we do it from Brussels alone. If we want to be successful in implementing things we need to implement, we absolutely need to be fully engaged with people in their villages, in their cities, in their towns, in the regions they live in, and therefore we need to be fully engaged with you. Uh, without that, we will not be successful. I will give you one very concrete example. As you know, the Commission has put forward a number of proposals to shift our economic model towards a, a more sustainable model based on a circular economy. Uh, we've put forward ideas on the circular economy, on how we treat waste, what we need to do with plastic, what the social pillar should look like in those circumstances. These things affect every individual citizen. And we can't, we can't just say we do this at the European level, send the decisions to uh, the member states, and then everything will happen uh, by itself. Waste, you cannot have a waste policy that works if you are not fully engaged with local authorities. They are the ones responsible for that. And if you don't have a waste policy that works, you will not have a circular economy. And if you don't have a circular economy, you will not be able to grasp the opportunities the world will have to offer in the fourth industrial revolution. So the challenges we will be facing in the next coming uh, uh, years will, first of all, be what is our answer to the anxieties people feel, the fundamental feeling of insecurity because of the international security situation, but also because of the changing of, of the challenges globalization is throwing at us. Secondly, what is a sustainable answer to the challenge of migration? Is it just building higher fences or borders, or do we have uh, slightly more sophisticated answers to a problem that will not go away by itself and will certainly not go away only by building walls and fences? Thirdly, do we have answer to the challenge of what I would say tribalism and nationalism? Do we, do we provide security that goes beyond the simple answer, if I can keep the other out, I will be safe, which is an answer that might work in the short term, but will certainly not, not work in the long term. But the most fundamental question we need to answer is, what do we have to offer so that people no longer stand with their backs to the future and look at a past that never was for a source of solutions that will never be? So I put it before you that we have to find common solutions for problems that can no longer be addressed only uh, at the national or European uh, level, but need all levels to be engaged. In this framework, the task force we have started at the Commission that should be able to write a report uh, by July has to look at, at mainly three things. The procedures we have in place today to look at su subsidiarity and proportionality, are they working or are they working well enough? What can we do to improve that, to make sure that we don't make mistakes, to make sure we concentrate on what is big and important and we get rid of what is no longer or is not big and important. Secondly, what are the areas where Europe should perhaps do less and leave more to local, regional or national authorities? What could be areas where Europe should be doing more because local or regional or national authorities can no longer handle the issue uh, on their own? And thirdly, very importantly, how do we structurally engage local and regional authorities in our process of uh, lawmaking and of law implementation? How do we make sure we have this constant dialogue so that experiences are fed into the system, mistakes are taken out of the system, and that you all feel part of the system when we uh, devise legislation and implement legislation? Uh, so, uh, and I'm now looking forward uh, to your questions, if you have any.
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier vice-président. Et nous allons tout de suite donner suite à votre invitation euh, de contribuer au débat. Nous ferons un premier tour où les porte paroles des différents groupes se manifesteront et puis nous continuerons avec un tour euh, avec des interventions plus individuelles. Je demande à tout le monde de respecter scrupuleusement le temps de parole et je vous annonce déjà, sans que je veuille fasse du mal, faire du mal à qui que ce soit, je serai très strict sur le, res, sur le respect euh, de ce temps de parole. D'ailleurs, la technique de cette salle le permet, il, il suffit juste de pousser euh, sur un bouton et on ne vous entend plus. Nous commençons avec euh, le premier orateur euh, qui parle au nom de, de, de l'IPP, euh, c'est notre collègue euh, Van den Donk. Meneer de vice-president, dank voor uw inspirerende en heldere betoog dat de ambitie van Europa frisse moed en nieuwe energie en ideeën geeft. Uh, mooi om dat te horen. Mag ik kort um, wijzen op het feit dat u dat ook doet door die taskforce die u in het werk heeft gesteld, die volgens mij een hele strategische vernieuwende ideeën uh, kan opleveren over de toekomst van hoe wij samenwerken. Europa is een multilevel democracy. Wij hebben leden in het Europese parlement, maar eigenlijk zijn al onze lokale en onze regionale provinciale volksvertegenwoordigers ook europarlementariërs. En het zou misschien een idee zijn om niet alleen in de administratie, maar ook in de democratie zelfs te kijken of we niet wat vernieuwende gedachten kunnen ontwikkelen die ervan uitgaan dat soevereiniteit geen zero-sum game is. Dat we dat samen moeten doen. En bijvoorbeeld de controletaak op uitgaven, een traditionele taak van parlementen, ook lokaal en regionaal kunnen beleggen zonder dat dat opnieuw moet worden gedaan op het Europese of nationale niveau. Ik denk dat het goed is om wat nieuwe ideeën te ontwikkelen die concreet ook in concrete voorstellen kunnen landen die bijdragen aan uw programma van minder regulering en tegelijkertijd daardoor ook het debat niet zozeer over meer of minder Europa, maar het soort resultaten dat wij samen in Europa moeten boeken in de lokale en regionale democratie thuis brengt. Ik denk dat het tijd wordt om dat opnieuw te denken. Ik ga niet langer spreken, er zou veel meer over te zeggen zijn, maar ik wens u en de taskforce veel succes en u kunt rekenen op het steun van, het, uh, van dit comité dat in de harten en de zielen van de mensen in Europa zit. Dank u wel. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue Barbara Duden pour le PSE. Ja, danke schön, uh, Herr Präsident. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, lieber Franz Timmermans, wir bewundern den Mut und den Elan, mit der die Europäische Kommission das Projekt einer Taskforce zum Thema Subsidiarität und Verhältnismäßigkeit aus der Taufe gehoben hat, mit dem Ziel ist, in weniger als sechs Monaten äh, zu regeln. Und wir alle wissen, dass die Interpretation dessen, was wir hier tun, seit mehr als 25 Jahren in Wirklichkeit umstritten ist. Welche Ebene, was, zu welchem Zeitpunkt und in welcher Detail Tiefe regeln sollen, ist eine zentrale Debatte in all unseren politischen Systemen. Und ich als Vertreterin des Stadtstaates Hamburg im föderalen Deutschland weiß, wie schwierig diese Frage manchmal im konkreten Fall zu beantworten ist. Das zeigt unsere aktuelle Diskussion in Deutschland über den Föderalismus im Bildungsbereich. Für die EU haben wir dieses Thema bei jeder Vertragsreform der letzten Jahrzehnte debattiert. Wir haben uns gefragt, was die EU tun soll und was nicht. Wir haben verschiedene Kompromisse gefunden und wir haben dann manchmal festgestellt, dass wir nachjustieren müssen, dass wir neu überlegen müssen. Und wir mussten uns auch manchmal von liebgewordenen Gewohnheiten verabschieden. Meine Vorredner haben hier es auch gesagt. Wir freuen uns natürlich ganz besonders, dass wir mit drei Vertretern in dieser Taskforce eingeladen worden sind. Wir finden, dass es eine angemessene Anerkennung der Tatsache ist, dass die EU zwar laut Vertrag eine, EU, äh, eine Union der Bürger und der Staaten ist, aber dass sie eben auch eine Vielzahl von Strukturen unterhalb der Staatenebene repräsentiert und dass wir deshalb sowohl das Interesse als auch die Berechtigung haben, darüber mitzureden. Und umso bedauerlicher ist es für uns, dass das Europäische Parlament zum gegenwärtigen Zeitpunkt beschlossen hat, äh, sich an dieser Debatte nicht zu beteiligen. Wir sagen gerade im Zusammenspiel zwischen den demokratisch gewählten Ebenen auf lokaler, regionaler und natürlich auch der europäischen Ebene muss die Frage, wer trifft welche Entscheidung und ist dann auch politisch dafür verantwortlich austeriert werden. 
Schon vor der Einrichtung der Taskforce haben wir Sozialdemokraten im Ausschuss der Region immer die Meinung vertreten, dass diese Debatte in beiden Richtungen ergebnisoffen geführt werden muss. Das bedeutet, dass es durchaus sein kann, wie im Mandat der Taskforce ja auch beschrieben, dass es Dinge gibt, die zurzeit auf EU-Ebene geregelt werden, wo aber dann natürlich auch nationale oder auch Ebenen darunter wieder mehr Verantwortung übernehmen sollten. Ich glaube aber, und ich habe auch Zweifel, ob dieses für ganze Politikbereiche, wie es ja realistischerweise auch immer der Fall wäre, sich handeln kann. Ich glaube, Europa gibt den Rahmen vor und die Details werden vor Ort geregelt, was auch immer Ort in den Verfassungsstrukturen der einzelnen Mitgliedstaaten auch heißt. Wir haben aber auch in den vergangenen Jahren sehr eindringlich gesehen, dass europäische Kompetenzen und vermutlich auch europäische Mittel und vielleicht auch neue europäische Durchgriffsmöglichkeiten, dass wir die brauchen, um neue Herausforderungen zu meistern. Ich will jetzt nur ganz kurz noch einmal darauf hinweisen, dass wir in den vergangenen Jahren ja auch sehr oft über Integration von Flüchtlingen, EU-Schutz der Außengrenzen debattiert haben. Und das alles wird sozusagen auch ein Bestandteil der Diskussion sein. Und wir müssen gucken, dass die Frage des Schutzes bestimmter Mindeststandards im Bereich der Grundrechte und der Rechtsstaatlichkeit, die eigentlich notwendig sind, damit wir vertrauensvoll miteinander sozusagen arbeiten können, dass man die auch europäisch beantworten muss. Und wir werden ja auch morgen eine Resolution zur Situation der Rechtsstaatlichkeit in Polen diskutieren. Ich, will jetzt, ich könnte dazu noch sehr viel mehr sagen, aber ich will noch einmal darauf hinweisen, dass wir in diesem Sinne bei den Bemühungen in beiden Bereichen, bei der Rechtsstaatlichkeit und bei der Subsidiarität, gutes Gelingen wünschen. Und ich freue mich, dass wir im Ausschuss der Region mit unserem Wissen und unseren Erfahrungen dazu beitragen können. Und ich glaube, dass wir alle auch im Hinblick auf die Wahlen 2019 dieses Thema wirklich aktiv diskutieren müssen, auch wenn es nicht der große Bringer im Bereich der Europawahlen sein wird. Es ist aber eine ganz, ganz notwendige Diskussion, die wir führen müssen. Vielen Dank, dass Sie mir zugehört haben. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à Madame Maria Ilorza Zubiria. Thank you, Chairman. I will make my speech in Basque, since I represent the Basque government in here. Nere lehen itzak, ongi etorria emateko Timmermans jaunari, eta baita ere esateko Tax Force martxan jarri izana txalotzen dugula. Europaren etorkizunaren inguruko gogo eta abian denean, ezinbestekoa da, subsidiero etasunaz, proporzionu altasunaz, eta eskualden eta tokiko administrazioen paperaz itza egitea. Horregaitik, sorterik eta onena, Opa diogu Timmermans, presidente ordeari alegin horretan. Eta pres gaude, pres gaituzu, bide horretan ekarpenak egiteko. Europar batasunak gaur egun erronka handiak ditu aurrean. Zuk zeuk batzuk mentatu dituzu. Eta sinetxita gaude, erronka horiek gainditzeko modu bakarra indarreak batzea dela. Estatu kideen indarreak bai, noski, baina baita, eskualde eta tokiko administrazioarenak. Europako eskualdeen batzordearen sorrera aurrera pauso bat izan zen eskualdeak erabaki prozeduretan txertatzeko. Egindako bidea importantea izanik, bada ordua aurrera pauso berriak egiteko. Eta Tarks Tax Force horrek horretarako aukera paregabea ematen digu. Ona hemen gogoetarako proposamen pare gaur luzatu nahi ditu danak Bat, eta lehena, eskualdeen batzordeari pixu gehiago nola eman etorkizunean. Adibidez, derregorrezko konsultagaiak zabalduz, zenbait gaietan bere iritsia lotezlea eginez, hortik ideia batzuk. Bigarrena, bada ordua pentsatzeko ere, zerrol asumitu behar duten edo dugun, eskumen legegileak ditugun, dituzten eskualdeek. Eta hori esaten dut, erantzukizun partekatuaren ikuspuntutik abiatuta. Iraganean, gai honen inguruan egintako estabaidak errekuperatzea proposatzen dugu, eta horietan sakontzea. Konkretuki, eta besteak beste, lamasur txostena eta eskualde asoziatuaren estatusa datozkit burura. 
zuk esan bezala, herrien Europa eraikitzeko denak gara beharrezko. Eta gaia saldatuz, bestalde, tax force horrek landu beharreko gaien artean, badago bat degarria egiten zaidana eta degarria esaten dut zeren astertu egingo da ze kompetentzi bueltatu behar zaizkie estatu kideei. Eta esaten dut degarria zeren Europaren etorkizunaren liburu zuriak proposatzen dituen alternatiben artean, bada gutxien ez bat integrazioan aratago joatea proposatzen duena. Beraz, eskumenak bueltatzea baino, Europa Gratasunak gehiago eukiko lituzke. Hau esan da, eskertuke nuke, Timermans presidente ordeak nahi izango balu, gai honen inguruan argibide batzuk esatea. Eskerri gasko. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant notre collègue Karl Van Lohu. Dank u wel, meneer de voorzitter. Meneer de vicevoorzitter van de Europese Commissie, ik zal in uw en mijn taal spreken. Namens de Europese Alliantie wil ik u alvast bedanken voor uw aanwezigheid en ook de kans om hier vandaag met u in debat te treden. Zoals u weet wil mijn fractie een sterkere rol voor deelstaat en regionale parlementen in het Europees besluitvormingsproces. Dat is volgens mij ook een van de kerntaken van de taskvork dat onder uw voorzitterschap binnenkort zal starten. De Europese Unie is nog steeds zeer sterk georganiseerd vanuit een pure lidstaatoptiek. Voor ons is het nogthans duidelijk dat subsidiariteit niet zomaar een discussie is over een bevoegdheidsverdeling tussen de Europese Unie en de lidstaten. Wel is het een principe dat wij volledig doortrekken, inclusief ook decentralisatie, naar een deelstaat, lokaal en regionaal niveau. En collega's, dat houdt natuurlijk ook in dat een democratische oproep naar meer autonomie niet wordt neergeslagen op een weinig democratische manier. Meneer de vicevoorzitter, de situatie in Catalonië dwingt mij hier om hier vandaag opnieuw de houding van de Europese Unie aan de kaak te stellen. Veelal wijst de Europese Unie bepaalde landen terecht. Maar kan Europa blijven zwijgen over de rechtsstaat, over fundamentele rechten en vrijheden, wanneer schendingen worden getolereerd in één van haar lidstaten. Wat vindt u van aanhoudingsbevelen tegen, Europe, tegen verkozenen voor het uiten van een politieke mening? Vindt u het organiseren van een democratisch referendum hetzelfde als misbruik maken van overheidsgelden? Wat vindt u van het feit dat rebellie zonder geweld in Spanje strafbaar is in tegenstelling tot de rest van de Europese Unie? Meneer de vicevoorzitter, anno 2018 zitten er politieke gevangenen achter de tralies in één van uw lidstaten. Ik roep iedereen daarom nogmaals op om dit ten strengste te veroordelen. Laat deze politieke gevangenen vrij. Freedom for political prisoners. Merci beaucoup. Le prochain orateur is notre collega Rob Jonkman. Dank u wel, voorzitter. En uh, um, graag wil ik uh, de vicepresident van uh, de van commissie uh, welkom heten, uh, heer Timmermans. Uh, we zijn blij met het werkprogramma zoals het er ligt uh, in grote lijnen. Met name circulaire economie is natuurlijk ook een heel belangrijk onderdeel, wat u ook al uh, noemde in uw uh, toespraak. Daar zijn we buitengewoon uh, gelukkig mee. Uh, Um, nou moet ik u zeggen, we zijn niet met alles gelukkig. Dus ik uh, wil meteen een domper op de feestvreugde zetten. Wij zijn namelijk uh, toch wel wat ongelukkig, omdat we zien dat er ook toch een stuk centralisatie weer aan de orde is. Als het gaat over budget en als het gaat over uh, 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 economie. En natuurlijk, alles wat Europees gedaan moet worden, moet Europees gedaan worden. Maar het is wel degelijk zo dat we ook uh, vanuit lokale en regionale uh, uh, autoriteiten... Een, een meer belangrijke rol moeten spelen. Ik refereer alleen maar al aan het klimaat en aan het milieu. Um, de taskforce subsidiariteit die zou daar ook op moeten toezien. En wij zijn blij dat die ingesteld is. Wij hopen dat het net zo succesvol wordt als het Refit-platform. Daar zijn we enthousiast over. En in die zin uh, uh, hopen we dat daar goede resultaten uh, geboekt uh, zullen worden. Uh, uh, wij denken wel dat, uh, um, dat we daar heel nadrukkelijk ook moeten kijken of we ook daadwerkelijk die uh, lokale en regionale overheden kunnen meenemen. 
Als wij een voorbeeld geven, als het gaat over het Europees semester, dan is hier unaniem door het comité aangenomen uh, een, uh, dat er een gedragscode zou moeten komen over de uh, betrokkenheid van uh, lokale en regionale overheden bij dat semester. We zien ook dat het parlement daar uh, dat van harte ondersteunt. Maar ik moet u zeggen, als we bij de commissie komen, dan vinden we eigenlijk uh, daar een redelijk gesloten deur. En dat is teleurstellend. Dus wij hopen uh, ook dat we, als het gaat over uh, dit aspect, dat we daar toch ook uh, ons uh, uh, steentje mogen bijdragen. Omdat wij, en wat terecht wat u zegt, het meest dicht bij die burger zitten. En wij ook straks bij de Europese verkiezingen daar ook nadrukkelijk Europa goed willen uitventen. Uh, dank u wel. Merci beaucoup, puisque le groupe PPE avait demandé de répartir son temps de parole de 4 minutes entre deux personnes. Je donne encore dans ce premier tour de débat la parole à notre collègue Raffaele Cataneo. Merci. Presidente Timmermans, la subsidiarité pour nous populaire est un thème qui est particulièrement à cœur. E riteniamo che la Task Force non possa occuparsi solo delle procedure legate alla sussidiarietà, ma debba riflettere su come possa essere applicata oggi questa idea rivoluzionaria. La sussidiarietà rappresenta la sintesi della nostra visione politica eh, e della nostra cultura, ovvero l'idea che la persona e la società vengono prima dello Stato e che il compito di qualunque istituzione, compresa l'Unione Europea, è quello di aprire spazio alle persone e alla società e di riconoscere che le persone non sono numeri, non sono cifre, ma hanno un volto. Riconoscere il volto dell'altro ci fa essere una comunità. Non a caso Comunità Europea è il primo nome scelto dai padri fondatori. La prima comunità è la famiglia, poi ci sono le formazioni sociali, ma subito dopo ci sono le comunità locali, con le loro istituzioni, i comuni, le province, le regioni. E noi vogliamo che queste istituzioni abbiano una voce più forte in Europa, che possano far sentire di più la loro voce nella costruzione delle politiche europee. Riteniamo che la sussidiarietà sia un'idea potentissima, un'idea rivoluzionaria, una visione politica che può e deve cambiare le politiche europee per riavvicinarle ai cittadini. E allora crediamo che la Task Force debba rispondere innanzitutto a queste tre domande. La prima, cosa deve essere ancora fatto a livello europeo? La seconda, Cosa invece non deve essere più fatto a livello europeo perché può essere lasciato alle istituzioni locali e nazionali? E la terza, come possiamo migliorare il contributo che le regioni e gli enti locali possono dare alla costruzione delle politiche europee? Certamente dovremo occuparci anche delle soluzioni tecniche, ma io mi aspetto che la Task Force sappia darci innanzitutto un contributo, una risposta a questo più profondo livello politico. Grazie. Merci beaucoup. Et après ce premier tour, j'ai l'honneur de repasser la parole au premier vice-président de la Commission qui va réagir à toutes vos idées. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say this. We've seen in the past in Europe this idea that the European Union can only be built against the member states. So there is sometimes this paradigm in the discussion, more Europe means less member state. Um, more Europe means less region, or more Europe can mean more region and then also less member state. This is a sterile and destructive approach to European integration and to European cooperation. I profoundly believe that if we believe we can use, instrumentalize Europe to change constitutional arrangements in member states, we all lose. Constitutional arrangements in member states are the responsibility of the member states as long as those constitutional arrangements are in line with the principles of the rule of law, respect for human rights, and respect for democracy. And I will not be a member of a European Commission that is instrumentalized by people who have a domestic agenda that is, uh, that is directed at changing the, uh, the um, constitutional arrangement in a member state. 
rule of law means, and my responsibility in the rule of law means, I need to check whether democracy is functioning, whether separation of powers is functioning, whether uh, the uh, human rights of individuals are respected, etc., etc. And in the case of Spain, which was raised here today, the Commission has no criticism of the functioning of the rule of law, of the functioning of democracy, and uh, the functioning uh, uh, of uh, and the uh, application of human rights. If you disagree with a law, you can say so, and you can protest to have the law changed. You can fight to have the law changed in a democratic way. You can disagree with it, and you can work to change it. But you can't violate it. You can't ignore it. And then if you violate a law, you can't just criticize a judge for applying the law, which is a democratic law based on the, on the rule of law and on the Constitution. This is the position of the European Commission. And may I add, this is also the position of, if I'm not mistaken, all member states' uh, governments in the European Union pertaining to uh, uh, the situation in Spain. I wanted to be very clear about this because I think it is just not, it is going to lead to paralyzing all of us if we think we can use one level of government against another level of government via Europe or whatever. The responsibility for the uh, constitutional structures in member states is in the hand of the member state itself. And what we do as European Commission is based on a treaty that was signed and ratified by all member states in the national parliament, sometimes even followed uh, with referenda. That is the basis upon which we work. Those are the rules I need to follow. In that framework, sovereignty, and, and here I would like to, to refer also to something that President Macron has said repeatedly, you can, ha you can take a different look at, so you can have an idea of sovereignty which is purely nominal. I want sovereignty for sovereignty's sake. But you can also have a look at sovereignty in material terms, as does President Macron. And then he says, we need more European sovereignty, which is the capacity to act, the capacity to act and provide solutions that are wanted by our citizens, our cities, our regions, and our member states. And I would wish that we could not look in an ideological way at what we need to do, but in a pragmatic way. Are we going to solve the climate crisis only by member states acting individually? No, we need global solutions. And those global solutions will only come about in the way Europe wants if Europe is united in fighting for these global solutions. And these global solutions have effect at a local level. If you think about emissions, if you think about how you treat waste, treat waste if you think about what we need to do with plastics. And I would welcome a debate about sovereignty along those lines. And this is how I intend to also have the debate in the task force. <coughs> what is the best level for us to provide results? And then also look at existing EU policies. And I would not exclude that we come to the conclusion that in this and this and this and this area, it worked well in the past, but given the challenges of the future, it might be best to let those policies in the hands of national or even regional or local authorities. I would welcome a discussion, and I have, it's also an open invitation to you to please provide us with as much ideas, as many ideas and as many um, contributions to how we could come up with uh, good uh, uh, solutions. So, honestly, let me underscore this. We need, the tasks we are faced with are so fundamental in a society that is no longer paternalistic. We can no longer go out there and say to people, trust us, we'll take care of things, and come back in five years and vote again. That's no longer how society works. But still, even if society don't want paternalism, there is an incredible craving for pedagogy, for talking to people about where the world is heading and how we should shape that world so it serves their interests. And there is nothing, nothing the European Commission can do in this area if it is not supported by you. Because you know better than anybody else how to talk to people where you are. What is what they want to, want to talk about? What is the solutions they want? So what I have to offer 
is a partnership from the bottom of my heart, a partnership so that we do not talk about ourselves, our own competences, our positions, but that we talk only about the dreams and anxieties of the people we are meant to represent, which are our voters, our citizens, who are waiting for us to come with solutions for problems they see. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour ces réponses. Et maintenant, nous passons à un second tour dans notre débat auquel se sont inscrits huit intervenants. Je clôture maintenant la liste des orateurs et je signale à chacun de ces orateurs qu'il a exactement une minute. Et une minute, c'est 60 secondes pour ceux qui font des calculs. Le premier orateur, c'est notre collègue Jens Yves. Tak for ordet, og tak til Frans Zimmermann, og tak for det fantastiske arbejde, som EU-kommissionen nu har sat i gang. I Danmark har vi en stor opbakning til EU. Vi er bevidste om, at EU er godt for velstand og for at løse de opgaver, som vi skal stå sammen om i EU. Men danskerne reagerer negativt på detaljstyring. De er meget positive derfor over for den taskforce, som Frans Zimmermann står i spidsen for omkring subsidiaritetsprincippet. Det er et vigtigt skridt, og det er et vigtigt skridt, som kommissionen derfor også nøje bør overveje, hvornår detaljregulering er på sin plads, og kun gør det i det tilfælde, hvor problemerne ikke kan løses nationalt. EU-kommissionen bør fokusere på de problemstillinger, der er grænseoverskridende og for komplekse til, at det enkelte medlemsstat selv kan løse problemet. Jeg vil gerne bede kommissionen om at blive op i helikopteren og rette fokus mod de samfundsordninger, som landene ikke selv kan løse. Det vil give EU legitimitet og stor opbakning for borgerne. Tak. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue Begona Martinez. Buenas tardes. Quería agradecer igualmente aquí. Quería agradecer como el resto de los colegas que me han precedido la intervención del vicepresidente Timmermans nuevamente ante este pleno eh, por dos cuestiones, fundamentalmente por la información que nos facilita acerca del programa de la comisión y también por la oportunidad que nos brinda para manifestar nuestras preocupaciones y nuestras prioridades. En ese sentido de su intervención me ha gustado especialmente la referencia que ha hecho al necesario compromiso con las personas y la defensa de sus intereses. Sabe que en el Comité de las Regiones se lleva hablando eh, en los últimos tiempos mucho de una preocupación que tenemos muchas regiones, como es el reto demográfico. Es una preocupación en, eh, gracias a la que ha habido consenso y que efectivamente hemos conseguido también trasladar a la Comisión. Quería decirle en este sentido que La Rioja acogerá en el mes de junio una conferencia para ver la posición de Europa ante este reto y para ver también el nuevo enfoque necesario de Europa, un enfoque que creemos que debe ser integrador y que debe ser inteligente. El reto demográfico tiene muchas variables y tiene muchos factores en los que influye, y uno especial, y por eso retomo lo que usted decía acerca del compromiso con, con las personas, es el de los jóvenes, que es un elemento fundamental para asegurar... Il faut conclure, parce que le temps de parole ya pasé de 20 segundos. Acabo ya. Simplemente decir que efectivamente nos gustaría que incorporara la perspectiva de la juventud y fundamentalmente de la emancipación juvenil en la agenda también, tanto en el pilar social como en el propio ámbito de la juventud, en el programa de la Comisión Europea. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. El próximo orador es nuestro colega Fernando Clavillo. Estimado comisario Timmermans, intervengo en este pleno no solo como presidente del gobierno de Canarias, de las Islas Canarias, sino como titular de la Conferencia de Presidentes de las Regiones Ultraperiféricas. Como sabe, la diferencia de desarrollo que tienen las regiones ultraperiféricas respecto de los países vecinos favorece los flujos migratorios, que además resultan más fáciles debido a su proximidad geográfica. Además, nuestras regiones son fronteras exteriores de Europa en sus respectivas zonas geográficas. En este marco, y con respecto a los flujos migratorios, las RUP padecen situaciones diversas tanto en lo que respecta a su intensidad como a su gestión. 
Asimismo, algunas RUC, particularmente Canarias, Mayotte y Guayana, han experimentado o experimentan una fuerte inmigración ilegal que se manifiesta en un aumento importante de menores no acompañados y de jóvenes principalmente. Esta inmigración plantea problemas de gestión para estos territorios y más aún para los que tienen una demografía galopante, teniendo repercusiones importantes en nuestras políticas públicas como la educación, el abastecimiento de agua y el saneamiento, la gestión de residuos, el transporte, la oferta médico-social, deportiva y cultural. A modo de ejemplo, Mayotte es desde la Lampedusa del Océano Índico, ya que cuenta con numerosos millares de muertos desde 1995 debido al naufragio de barcos. O en el caso de mi región, Canarias, situación afortuna, la situación afortunadamente no llega a los extremos de la gravedad. Faut conclure. Le temps a pasé de 15 segundos. Une dernière phrase, s'il vous plaît, et puis on passe au prochain orateur. Sufrida en el 2006, pero hemos de estar vigilantes. Por todo ello, querido comisario, como representante de las regiones ultraperiféricas, quisiera saber qué tipo de medidas piensa diseñar la Comisión Europea para llevar a cabo una gestión solidaria de las fronteras respecto a las RUP y qué pasos va a seguir para efectuar una verdadera política de inmigración en las RUP creando instrumentos de financiación. Bueno, gracias. El tiempo ha pasado ahora, porque eso es ya casi dos faltas de palabra, no va a pasar nada. El próximo orador es nuestra colega Susan Díaz. Muchas gracias. En primer lugar, quiero agradecer al vicepresidente, al señor Timmermans, como presidenta que soy de una región en el sur de España con nueve millones de habitantes, la defensa que ha hecho de la democracia española, de nuestro Estado de Derecho, porque fuera de la democracia y del cumplimiento de las leyes lo que hay en la selva y la desprotección de los ciudadanos. Así que muchísimas gracias. Y en segundo lugar, defiendo más Europa, más Europa y más fuerte. Es la mejor manera de recuperar a los ciudadanos, de que los ciudadanos vuelvan a confiar en sus instituciones. Para eso, desde Andalucía defendemos una política de cohesión más ambiciosa, con más inversión, que garantice la cohesión social y la cohesión económica y que se tenga en cuenta la dimensión territorial de esa política de cohesión, que nos permitirá dar lo mejor de nosotros mismos como regiones. Frente a los desafíos, algunos se han hecho referencia aquí, al Brexit que Andalucía le va a impactar, la política de migración a la que ya nos está afectando, los conflictos geopolíticos y también el auge del populismo que tanto daño le ha hecho a la Unión Europea y que ha galopado sobre el sufrimiento de los ciudadanos. Así que muchísimas gracias, señor Timmermans, por esa declaración de apoyo a la democracia española y la confianza que tenemos desde el sur de España en nuestras instituciones europeas. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Le prochain orateur est notre collègue Théo Bovens. Meneer de eerste vicevoorzitter, beste Frans Timmermans, uw uiterlijk mag dan nog wel iets veranderd zijn. Uw enthousiasme is jeugdig en vurig gebleven. Hetgeen ik toejuich. Morgen spreekt het comité over het adviesrapport van rapporteur Ivan Zagar over de bevordering van naadloze mobiliteitsoplossingen. Naadloze mobiliteit is wat mijn regio betreft grenzeloze mobiliteit. Ik ben gouverneur van uw thuisprovincie Limburg. En vanwege onze grensligging ben ik extra geïnteresseerd in de uitkomsten van de taskforce. Subsidiariteit kan namelijk meerdere kanten opwerken. Meer bevoegdheden bij regio's kan ook betekenen meer mogelijkheden voor samenwerkende grensregio's, voor EU-regio's. Maar er is ook een risico voor nieuwe grenzen tussen regio's. Als het vrije verkeer van goederen en personen goed is geregeld, biedt het immers kansen voor grensregio's. Namens grensprovincies zoals Limburg vraag ik u om oog te hebben voor de grenseffecten van nationale systemen, zoals bijvoorbeeld tolheffing. Ik hoop dat dit specifieke thema een plek krijgt in het werk van uw taskforce. En ik wens u daar heel veel succes bij. Dank u wel. Merci beaucoup. La parole va, va maintenant à notre collègue Marie-Angela Gougon. Thank you, President. Um, well, I have to say that I've somewhat changed the nature of my comments in response to v Vice President uh, Timmermans' last comments um, in response to the question about Catalonia, because I don't think you'll find a single person here is trying to interfere in the constitutional arrangements of Spain. And we heard earlier comments about democracy in Spain. All of us want to see democracy in Spain, but what does democracy mean to people in here? 
To me, democracy means not living in fear of violence. So it's not about interfering in the constitutional arrangements. Whatever we think of independence in Catalonia, uh, to me, that's entirely irrelevant to this argument. We're talking about condemning the violence. We talk about the future of Europe. Well, that's not the kind of, of Europe that I want to be part in, where we can see EU institutions simply stand aside and watch and let all of this happen. I was desperately keen today to talk about, I represent the Scottish Parliament here in the Committee of the Regions, and to talk about even the democratic deficit that we're experiencing there, where as a devolved administration, we have no direct impact in the negotiations that are currently taking place over matters that directly relate to us. And that our future in Europe was something we were desperately keen to see. Uh, but again, I say that's not the kind of future that I want to see. Uh, thank you, um, and I would urge you to, I would like to hear your, your response to that. Thank you very much. Voilà le deuxième tour passé, et je remercie quand même tout le monde globalement d'avoir respecté plus ou moins le temps de parole. Vous savez que nous voulons faire parler plus de gens lors de ce débat, mais ça a comme contrepartie ce respect du temps de parole, et je sais bien que je suis un peu impoli quand je coupe, mais c'est la seule façon d'arriver à notre objectif. En allemand, on dit parfois « der Zweck heiligt die Mittel », mais c'est un peu dangereux comme expression. Et maintenant, c'est la parole à nouveau à notre premier vice-président de la Commission. Merci beaucoup. Let me start immediately with the last point. Don't twist my words. I never said violence was okay. Come on. We, we, it's very clear that what happened during the referendum and the uh, uh, way the police acted was clearly led to a lot of worries across the European Union, worries that were also expressed by the European Commission, by myself. And since then, the Spanish authorities have clearly also declared that this should not have happened. So let's not mix things up here. Um, secondly, um, again, and Scotland is a good example of this, um, you operate within the law. If you want constitutional change, if you want constitutions to be uh, uh, rearranged in a sense of competences, etc., there are provisions that can be used. You do that through dialogue, through democratic means. Uh, unless, you live, uh, uh, unless you live in a dictatorship, then those rules don't apply. Then there is no rule of law, there's rule by law. And then you can challenge it and then you can ignore it, but not if there is rule of law. That's, that's the fundamental point I'm trying, I'm trying to make. I'm not judging whether the arrangement is right or wrong. That is something that in Spain, in the constitutional framework, they should sort out and sit down together and find ways that are acceptable uh, to everyone. But in any rule of law state, if you violate the law, if it's a democratic law, which is based on the rule of law, if you violate it, you will face consequences And by the way, these consequences in Spain are applied by independent judges. The judiciary is independent. So you might not like it, you might feel very strongly uh, for the cause of Catalan independence, and I fully respect that. That's not the point at all. The way is, the, the point is, how do we as European Commission relate to the legal situation and the legal situation I tried to explain? We watch whether It's a democracy, no doubt there. Whether the institutions are independent, whether there's a separation of powers, there's no doubt there. Whether there is violation of human rights in the sense of fundamental rights that are applicable to every single citizen of Spain, regardless of the region, there is no doubt there. So then the conclusion to us is clear. If you want change, you do it within the framework of the law. You have the right to challenge the law. You have the right to do everything with democratic means to change the law, you don't get the right just to ignore the law or violate the law. That's the point I'm, I'm trying uh, uh, to make. Um, secondly, um, borders. You know, the closer you live to a border, the more you're, you're aware of it. And we as, as nations, as citizens, as individuals, we cannot do without borders. It's a philo philosophical issue. You need borders, all sorts of borders. But borders should protect, should help to define, but borders should not be a hindrance when you want to develop your economy, when you want to travel, when you want to use the opportunities the, free, the four freedoms have to offer to every single European citizen. 
And one of the problems we then encounter is that national policies very often don't take that into account. When they don't think in terms of a European system of road pricing, which would I, I would think would be the way forward. But they go in, in their individual ways in doing that. The effects are the biggest, are the greatest for people who live near the border. It affects them immediately. And there are also, in, in social policies, you take decisions which immediately have effect on people who work across the border. And when I was still in national government, I always tried to have a formal um, moment introduced where you see, could we look into the effects a measure has on people who live in, at the borders? And perhaps this could be an interesting subject to discuss in the task force if we talk about the procedures we use when we develop European legislation and when we relate with national governments on legislation, should we not also be able to introduce just uh, sort of checking the box, what are the effects of people who live near the border? What are the effects on them? Are these effects commensurate? Uh, do they relate to the result you want to achieve, yes or no? And if the result is not achieved through that, how could we change that? And, and I strongly believe in as little burden as possible for citizens and, and businesses. Uh, uh, and I think we've achieved something over the last couple of years. We even get now SMEs being more enthusiastic of what we're doing, but we still need to proceed. And I think borders are an important issue in that. Migration, let me be very, very clear. If there is one issue that is not going to go away just because we wish it to go away, it's migration. If there's one issue that cannot be solved by building fences and walls, it's migration. Yes, we need better external border protection, without any doubt. But if you don't, we don't do anything about the root causes of why people are leaving from many African countries because they are afraid they will starve at home, if we don't do anything about the root causes, given the demographic development we see now and in the future, migration will increase as a challenge to Europe, manifold. So we need to do more to attack the root causes. Once people are at sea, we've lost. You cannot say to people who are at sea, go away, disappear, evaporate. They will have to land somewhere unless you take leave of your most fundamental human values. And I wish we in Europe will never do that. So you have to prevent them from going on boats, prevent them from leaving if they don't have a chance to get asylum in Europe because they don't have the right to that. Migrants who don't leave because of war and persecution don't have the right to asylum in Europe and should be returned to their places of origin. But it's much better to keep them in the place of origin before they start leaving. And for that, we will need huge European and international programs. And I fear here we need, we need some leadership, political leadership in all member states. We risk becoming penny-wise, pound-foolish if we do not see that investing in the development of Africa is the only way forward. Smartly divesting in the development of Africa if we want to prevent migration becoming more and more uh, a, a political problem in such a way that at the end of the day, Europeans will be set against each other. One of the elements that has weakened our ability to act in the last couple of years is the feeling that those people, those countries who are faced with an incredible influx of migrants simply because of the geography, simply because of where they are, do not see a show of solidarity of other fellow European countries and they feel abandoned. And then people are set against each other. The ones are set against each other because if we are abandoned, nobody's helping us. And the others are saying, we're not helping you because you're doing nothing to stop that. And so you create false images about each other. And that is paralyzing Europe at this stage. There will be a European solution for migration based on solidarity, or there will be no solution, and it will be one country against the other. Uh, it will be we, everybody for, for himself, and then nothing will happen, and the migration flows will only increase. Final point on, on uh, the younger generation. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges to Europe is that we are, we are all pigeonholing again. We are going 
We are looking for people who think like us, who agree with us, and we feel very cozy together with them. And we do not listen. We don't want to hear dissenting voices. We don't want to hear people who disagree with us. Just keep them away, and I'm happy. And this is a, a political thing, it's a national thing, and it's a generational thing. And I strongly believe in what Willy Brandt once said, that positive societal change can only occur if there is an alliance between grandparents and grandchildren. His way of saying, if the generations find each other, then we will find solutions. And if we don't have a project that will, um, how should I say, that will seduce the young Europeans to be part of our collective future, then Europe will fail. So in that sense, I believe on the, in the social pillar, if it is not founded on solidarity across generations, then it will fail and Europe will fail. I strongly believe in that, and we will work as a commission to offer some concrete solutions in that direction. Final word, nothing will happen if you don't work with us. So I'm very humbly asking for your support, uh, humbly asking for your cooperation, you don't need to agree with us, work with us, so we find solutions that we can all agree with. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. Monsieur le Premier Vice-President, cher Franz, merci beaucoup pour cette possibilité que nous avons eue d'échanger nos points de vue, d'avoir un débat avec tout de même 13 de nos membres. Et en ce qui concerne la coopération future, nous serons, comme nous le pouvons, actifs dans la mise en œuvre du programme de travail, là où le comité peut s'engager. Et nous allons tout particulièrement, évidemment, maintenant essayer de faire de notre mieux pour contribuer au succès de la Task Force Subsidiarité que vous avez, je ne sais pas s'il faut dire l'honneur ou la charge de diriger. Le fardeau. Le fardeau. <rire> Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci.